Duke Radio. This is episode 24. Today is Thursday, April 19th, 2012. It's been 406 days since Fukushima happened. With me today is Jules and Kurt from a new show on Orion, Room 101, which airs Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. and Saturday, 1 to 3. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Or Good. afternoon. <laughs> yeah, only by a few minutes. Yeah. Kurt, you want to tell us about your um, new show a little bit? Uh, yeah, well, I'm... Uh... It, it's it's a little bit different of a format, I have to admit. Uh, getting into uh, some some different topics. Uh, one of the uh, Monday show actually was on the committee at three hundred. Want to get into some mind control, some stuff like that. Of course, current events because there's always plenty to talk about, uh, for sure. So um, you know, may, maybe I, I want to try and go in a direction where you know talk about things that well people don't really spend a whole lot of time on. And, um, you know, it's kind of a learning process, as I've mentioned numerous times just in the past couple of shows. It's going to be a learning process for me as well as hopefully uh, for the listeners. So it should be fun. Well, today is an anniversary of sorts. Um, I don't know if everybody's aware of the significance of April 19th. Do you know all the things that's happened on the state? A very strange, uh, you know, very, uh, kind of a coincidence, I guess. I don't really believe in coincidences, but um, yeah, the, yeah, April 19th, a lot has happened on this day, of course. Uh, Waco, Columbine, uh, Hitler's birthday is tomorrow, by the way. Uh, yeah, a lot, lot, of, lot of really unfortunate uh, things happened on this day. And Oklahoma City, Oklahoma too. Oklahoma right? City, how could I forget? Yes. A lot, lot of, uh, as a matter of fact, I believe Ken here from uh, Orion, the Information Nation, uh, he had, I believe, one of the filmmakers from the documentary, uh, oh my, it slips my mind, woo, bad Kurt, anyway, um, <laughs> it does, it really, it slips my mind. Uh, the I Inconvenient actually, Truth, is that what it was? Something like that? No, that was uh, Man Bear Pig. Yeah. Uh, Anyway. Well, a lot of people don't realize that when we're on radio, a lot of times we're on with each other till two or three in the morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so <laughs> this is kind of early for us. But the, a, the a lot theme, of late nighters for sure. <laughs> yeah, the theme for today's show is probably weird news, and that wasn't my plan. That's just the way it worked out. The Earth is still shaking, in a lot of weird places. In fact, we had an earthquake at the North Pole last night, a 4.8. And last weekend, we had three at the South Pole. And it's very unusual to have earthquakes in both of those places. There was another, probably an aftershock in Mexico um, by the Guatemala border of a 5.1. And there's been two very strange quakes out in the Pacific Basin, which is like halfway between Hawaii and Alaska. And there's a huge fault that um, actually hits the California coast around Eureka, I believe. And that's always been a, a spot that I've watched closely. Uh, Kentucky had a 2-5 in an area that doesn't usually have earthquakes yesterday. And late last night, there was an earthquake posted off the coast of Honshu that first came in at a 6-2. In fact, some of the Japan sites are still so showing it as a 6-2. All the other sites are showing it as a 5-2. And there were a few um, weird radiation stories, too. Some of them were in the forecast. But I wanted to read this uh, as a follow-up to the Canadian quakes that we talked about on the last show. We had um, noticed that there were a few around the Hudson Bay area and then far north of there in the Northwest Territories around a place called Great Slave Lake, which was a um, is an old dormant volcano area where there's lots of mining. Um, this story comes out of New Brunswick, though, and this was posted in the Canadian National Post, I believe yesterday. New Brunswick town plagued by, for weeks by earthquake swarm, and no one knows why. Uh, published April 17th. Springtime in McAdam, a tiny village in southwestern New Brunswick, is not far from the main border. It's like springtime in most other parts of Canada. Locals chatter about the NHL, the garden they are planting, the grass that needs to be cut, and the fish they can't wait to catch once the weather, warm weather, really settles in. Lately, however, something else has elbowed its way into the community's daily dialogue, pushing aside the playoffs. 
pushing its way to the top of all the talking points. You'll be out and about and people will say, did you feel the one last night or did you feel the one this morning? Some people will say yes, others may say no. It really depends on what you're doing. Residents were initially rattled awake at 1.40 a.m. on March 10th by a 2.4 magnitude earthquake that was followed three minutes later by a 1.4. People described hearing what sounded like an explosion. Pictures fell off walls, window panes rattled, floorboards creaked and groaned, some houses even shook while locals initially felt a surge of panic that eased somewhat by morning with the realization that a bomb had not gone off, but a small earthquake had. Three days later, they had two more. And in the five weeks since, there has been 35 additional shakes, a steady t tide of minor tremors that is a popular topic of conversation among villagers, and a seismic anomaly that scientists can't entirely explain. What is happening in McAdam is something called an earthquake swarm, says Stephen Halchuk, a seismologist with Natural Resources Canada. It is a series of earthquakes, which is rare, but what is particularly unusual about what is happening in McAdam is that it is basically happening directly beneath the village at a depth of less than one kilometer. So this is very similar to what was happening in Clintonville in Wisconsin. Researchers from the University of New Brunswick addressed community members at an atypical town hall meeting Monday night, answering questions and assuaging ling lingering fears. One working theory they have to explain the quakes is an early spring thaw. A rapid change in groundwater levels could perhaps be causing the underlying rocks to slip and stress, unleashing the multiple shocks. You know, just below this area, New Brunswick is like um, a very far east in Canada. Right below that is Maine. And there were um, some, some fairly sizable earthquakes that happened off the coast of Maine, too, last week. Uh, Christina, I mean, honestly, yeah. in um, looking at what's been happening up north there, it's making me a little bit nervous because, you know, like on... Um, uh, down on our side of the Canadian border, we have the Creighton that runs all the way down along through. And then up north, I don't remember what the name of that plate is, but it pretty much is a continuation of what we have down here in the Creighton. And that's supposed to be some of the most stable bedrock there is. It almost seems to me like there is some cracking going on, maybe some displacement. Yeah, and then that escarpment that we were talking about that runs from Niagara Falls all the way to Wisconsin, that's supposed to be very stable. People who live in Hamilton, Ontario, the, the escarpment runs, it's like a big cliff of rock, and it runs right through the middle of the city. And in fact, that's how they divided the city up the north and south of town, and the, the rocks have been falling off of that too in the last few weeks we talked about that before on here too so it is interesting when you also consider the fact that there's volcanoes going off everywhere yeah the, the whole planet has woken up according to uh, the last satellite survey so in other weird news coming from australia vomiting road workers hospitalized after exposing mysterious nuclear waste road workers be began vomiting and were hospitalized Wednesday after being exposed to suspected nuclear material unearthed during a highway upgrade in Australia. The material, said to include cesium, is believed to have been buried after a truck carrying radioactive isotopes from Sydney's Lucas Heights nuclear reactor crashed in the area in December of 1980. The isotopes are believed to have been destined for the U.S. The upgrade project manager, Bob Higgins, said the workers became sick after unearthing a strange clay-like material. You don't see that. And when it was exposed to air, it would get an orange streak through it. He told the radio station that interviewed him. There were a number of workers that felt a little bit of nausea, and there was a bit of vomiting when they were in close proximity. I want to um, also share with you what happened when this crash occurred in 1980. We'll be back in a few. You're listening to Nuked Radio. Welcome back to Nuked Radio. We were talking about some nuclear material that was unearthed in Australia. And investigators are currently going through their archives to find out more information about the details of the 1980 crash. We're also ringing up old-timers who used to work at the reactor, he added. 
Several anti-nuclear blogs claim at the time of the accident, 16 people near the crash site suffered from radioactive poisoning and accused ANSO's predecessor, the Australian Atomic Energy Commission, and the then Health Commission of a cover-up. I mean, where have I heard that before? Cover-up with nuclear material? Never. Well, we just realized something uh, rather unusual when I was telling Jules what else I wanted to talk about this morning. There were a couple of dumpsters that were found to have radioactive materials inside of them yesterday. Two of them were on college campuses. The one that I have up in front of me is from U of M. A radioactive device was extracted from a scrap metal dumpster in an alley between the heating and cooling plant and the Meeman Journalism Building on April 12th. Sharon Whitaker, who works inside Meeman, said she was alarmed when she looked out her window and saw men in hazmat suits inside the dumpster. I was just thinking in my mind, something is not right, she said. The truck carrying the dumpster was scanned. At first, they say in this article it was a device. They emptied the dumpster, determined that the radioactive source was in the contents, but they couldn't figure out what exactly was radioactive, and the dumpster still continued to show some radioactivity even when it was empty. So um, there was a conference between the U of M Emergency Management Coordinator Police Services and a health physicist, and it was determined that there was no public risk to the health or the environment. So they put the dumpster back. Actually, you know what, Jules? I think this is the one from Tennessee. Yeah, they call it U of M, but it's the University of uh, Memphis. Okay. All right. And then this happened in Las Vegas yesterday, too. They also uh, found, apparently, these, these dumpster contents get scanned when they go to a recycling facility, and that's where they determine the source and traced it back to the original dumpster. Um, So I'm not sure what's going on there. It was 35% above background in this one article that I have. I I think we talked once before about um, some of my discoveries at one of the state universities in uh, New York. But at least here, um, there was a nuclear reactor on campus for research. And I had found out that it was leaking um, coolant water, so it wasn't the high-level radioactive, but it was like the, uh, oh, blah, 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 blah. I don't remember what it's called. You know, when you have one extra molecule, uh-huh. oxygen molecule, it was a long time ago, 25 years ago. But anyway, so um, we had some friends at the DEC, made a couple phone calls. Long and short of the story was that any type of radioactive material, at least in New York State, that's being utilized on a state campus is actually the responsibility of the state university for disposal. Like the NRC and EPA, any of those different um, groups really don't have much of a say. It's being yeah, the, left to the school. The only time they need to report to the NRC is when they have like a critical situation like they had at MIT a few weeks ago. But I think there's 23 or 24 reactors at college campuses around the country, that's not included in that total of 104. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you what, I mean, a lot of those uh, college campuses are in residential areas. I mean, I live six blocks from it. And imagine yeah. my surprise to find out I had a nuclear reactor six blocks from me that was leaking into the sewer system. Yeah, or there's dorms around the buildings because you know how, how close they, they pack stuff together. Mm-hmm. And or, they were storing um, the nuclear waste in the basement of the night school. You're kidding. No, all the ivy was dead on the side of that building. There was that story I was telling you about getting the creepy phone calls threatening me to drop it or something bad would happen to me because I was taking pictures and writing uh, an article about it. Yeah. I, w- I wonder how the dandelions look around that building now. <laughs> I don't know, actually. I haven't been back there in a long time. But. I've had some more people email me. In fact, uh, there's someone had commented on, on the video of the dandelions that I put up over last weekend that the actual term for the mutations that, uh, that we found is called fasciation. And I looked it up. It's also known as cresting. Like if you think of a rooster, the little th- red thing on the top of its head, that's the crest or the comb. And that's how the flowers grow. Instead of growing in a cylinder and being round, and where this r- can really show up too is in a cactus. 
instead of it like being one arm that goes straight up, it branches out into like a fan. And it's very common with mutations from radiation. They, they call it this witch's broom effect around Chernobyl. And uh, there was a, a video that was posted, and this guy did not put where he lived. He found a dandelion from last spring. It's the, the stalk is as big as your arm, and it has 26 heads. Wow. One flower stalk. It says fasciation is rare overall, but has been observed in at least 100 different plant species, including members of the aloe family, Celosia, Delphinium, Digitalis, Euphobia, Forsyth, Forsythia, Primula, Acer, Prunus, Cannabis, and many genera of cactuses. So I'll drop a link to this article and also some images. There's some great images on Google of this that you can see when you're looking around for, um, for examples of what those plants look like. And along those same lines of mutations, although this may be from the core exit that was dumped in the Gulf, posted on Al Jazeera yesterday, called Gulf Seafood Deformities Alarm Scientists. Eyeless shrimp and fish with lesions are becoming common, with BP oil pollution believed to be the likely cause. The fishermen have never seen anything like this, Dr. Jim Cohen told Al Jazeera, and in my 20 years working on Red Snapper, looking at somewhere between 20 and 30,000 fish, I've never seen anything like this either. Dr. Cohen with Louisiana State University's Department of Oceanography and Coastal Sciences, started hearing about fish with sores and lesions from fishermen in November of 2010. Cohen's findings replicate those of others living along the vast areas of the Gulf Coast that had been impacted by BP's oil and dispersants. And you know, I, I sent this, this article to a friend of mine that lives in Tampa yesterday. He, he doesn't know anything about this. They are just not talking about this in Florida. All they are talking about is tourism. Along with collapsing fisheries, signs of malignant impact on the regional e ecosystem are ominous. Horribly mutated shrimp, fish with oozing sores, underdeveloped blue crabs lacking claws, eyeless crabs and shrimp, and interviewees fingers point towards BP's oil pollution disaster as being the cause. And there's some pictures <clears throat> of these shrimp, and it's not that they just don't have eyes. They don't have eye sockets. And if you saw my kitten video, he didn't have eye sockets either. And we've posted some pictures of dolphins that have been caught in the Gulf recently that were actually put up by uh, shrimping companies on the web where these dolphins don't have eye sockets where they should be. You know, I saw two... Um Yesterday, RSOE had a couple alerts for, uh, I know we're not in the Gulf anymore, but up in uh, above Alaska. And I guess the whole problem with the um, polar bears and the seals and the walruses um, is getting even worse. And they're still not sure what's causing all the hair loss and the lesions. Well, no, better get moving on that. Yeah. Figure it out. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about giving them a call. Yeah, I mean, here tomorrow and, and asking them if uh, I can tape an interview. Of EnviroReporter.com, Michael Collins is here. Hi, thank you. Thank you for coming here, sir. Thank you. You're doing some uh, incredibly important work on your site, so it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, so to recap again, a giant earthquake into tsunami into nuclear meltdown in Fukushima. And people said immediately after that, scientists, environmental reporters, they said this stuff is going to get in the air. The radiation is going to get into the water. It's going to hit the, uh, the driftwood that's swirling around in the ocean. And eventually it might, who knows, actually hit the, the coast of the, the United States. Has that day arrived? That day arrived fairly quickly after those triple meltdowns began. Now, you're not going to get that out of our government. Uh, we've had a lot of wishful thinking, and I understand it. It's pretty grim stuff. Mm -hmm. But this is the worst man-made environmental disaster in history. It makes uh, Chernobyl look like a dinner mint compared to a buffet of bad news coming out of Fukushima. Okay. Uh, how, how do we know that, that, it, that it has arrived, though? What, what sort of testing is being done? Surely the government must have scientists out there pulling samples from everywhere and running a battery of tests? I wish. The government did do special testing for a while. They did pick up radionuclides that are absolutely uh, uh, related to a melted down reactor. Okay. Then they, 10 days before the Japanese admitted that there were three full uncontrolled meltdowns, 10 days before that, the United States Environmental Protection Agency said, uh, we're not going to test anymore because nothing can possibly get here. 
Wow. Now, we didn't take that tact. I've been an environmental journalist since 98. I've worked with radiation since about that time. And uh, my wife, Denise, and I, we decided we were going to set up a radiation station in Santa Monica because we're upwind of most of the greater L.A. basin. So we figured what radiation we would pick up in Santa Monica would be helpful for people to see. Sure. So for that entire time, we've had a 24-7 live streaming uh, a radiation station in Santa Monica. But we've done a lot of tests and we've found heightened radiation in all sorts of media. Well, so I, I know one of those things you tested, and it was a story that really blew up, especially here locally. People were, were kind of flailing their arms above their head, but it was with regard to the rainwater. Uh, there's normally there's trace amounts of radiation in rainwater, but apparently we had a downpour a couple of weeks back that was off the charts. It was off the charts. It was the highest radiation that we picked up in the last 13 months since the meltdowns began. What we found was is uh, in January, the University of California Davis came out with a report that said when uh, radioactive fuel is has water poured on it, like in Fukushima, where they're trying to keep it cool. Right, just trying to cool it down, pouring gallons keep, and gallons and gallons oh, of ocean water on it. Millions yeah. and millions of s gallons of seawater, fresh water. Mm -hmm. What happens to that water? Uh, UC Davis found out that the the water turns to peroxide. The radiation gets trapped in so-called buckyballs, which are like geodesic domes, mm -hmm. capture up to about 60 molecules of different types of uranium in these buckyballs. They're very light. They're very mobile. And we've been picking up what we think are buckyballs uh, here, even without rain, in Los Angeles. So what does that mean? It's getting into the mist? or it it's getting gets, into the it, You hit it. It's getting into the sea mist. There have been numerous studies out of Europe and the United Kingdom that have measured radiation in ocean water and seawater and then measured the same radiation up to 200 miles inland. So what we did was we took these two studies. This is what's happening with the radiation in Japan. This is how it can move across the Pacific all on our site. Mm -hmm. And this is how it can come inland. Give you an example. We measured some things that we'll, we'll check out right. just today, and the numbers are out of this world. Well, let's, let's do that. And, and actually, right before we do, uh, there's, there's a, a multitude of different types of radiation. There's, there's, there's some that are completely harmless and naturally occurring. There's, a, there's others that are very dangerous, even in just the slightest trace amounts. What kind of radiation are we talking about here? The, the latter. Uh, when you talk about normal radiation, you're talking about cosmic radiation, mm -hmm. radiation from the sun. People get uh, uh, skin cancer from that. When you talk about normal radiation, you got uranium, thorium, potassium uh, in the soil, and uh, that will create radon gas. These are so-called natural radiations. What you have in a nuclear reactor's core or in a spent fuel pond, you have a witch's brew of the most intense and most lethal radionuclides known to man, and it's all because of our doing. All right, let's, let's, let's actually, let's take a stroll on over to some of the stuff that you've been testing. Sure. And you can tell me about the device in your you hand, bet. which is what you use to test for this radiation. That's right. This is an inspector alert nuclear radiation monitor. It, che it detects uh, X-ray radiation, alpha radiation, beta radiation, gamma radiation, and another kind of radiation that's too uh, strange to even try to uh, tell you about. Okay. But what, this is a very... That's, that's the one with laser vision and, well, and Hulk out. Yeah, yeah I've course. been using it here. Believe me. <laughs> so uh, the thing is, is that you can pick up radiation, but this is a very sensitive device. So uh, we have been using this. We have one of these online streaming, and then we have another one where we go around and test stuff. Sure. Now, check this out. This here... I'm going to, if you don't mind, uh, put no, on some gloves. Um, what can, I'm sorry, Unless to our, I have sorry a, to our props department that put out these totally radiated <laughs> items. Um, without those gloves, that was very kind well, of you. Well, I don't need the gloves Michael. if I have a volunteer to handle this stuff. No. Can you take your No. Uh, none. Okay. None. Yeah, it's silence. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so here what we have here is something really quite amazing. This here is dust. This is dust from three HEPA filters out of my home office. Uh, in three different rooms. So this is collected from air filters within your house over right the last now. 40 days. Okay, over the last 40 this days. This is just dust. We're all breathing this. Right. In Santa Monica, California, right I on the ocean. I don't want to be standing next to it now because I have a feeling you're about to tell me it's off the proverbial charts. It's off the proverbial charts. Now, I'm going to uh, now tell what, what I'm going to do here is when you do play with uh, stuff that's radioactive, what you got to do, this is seaweed. We're going to get to this. I'm just going to pull this out a little bit. Seaweed's supposed to be healthy for you. That was seaweed I bought a year ago. Okay. And this is seaweed, seaweed that was Seaweed I bought on Friday the 13th. 
And believe me, it lives up to its day. So now that I've touched this stuff, I got to get rid of these because I don't want to get this stuff on the on the detector. Now, look, look there are there's some people watching this at home going, look, I eat sushi. I, I've, I've definitely handled some seaweed. Mm -hmm. I had a blue crab handle last week and I right. see you put on gloves. They might be freaking out right now. Is, is that entirely necessary? I don't. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, my my goal is not to freak people out. Right. The knowledge that you can get from knowing about this stuff can help improve your lives. Because the fact of the matter is there are ways to protect yourself against the water, the air, the food, and even being fearful. There are ways sure. to do that. Okay. Uh, this thing is on. Now I'm going to turn its sound on. You might be able to hear it off my mic. Yep, okay, a couple little clicks there. A couple clicks. This is just dust. I'm going to try to hold it up so the camera can get it. Watch this. Okay, so we're seeing it pop. We were hovering around 20, 28 or so, I think I called last time. Now we're at 50. Now, what is this number? What is this number that it's showing us? What is this Yeah, it's double right background. We've measured this before we came in so we don't have to stay on this all day mm -hmm. because it'll keep going up. This will go up to uh, approximately seven and a half times normal. Now, seven and a half times normal for something that uh, came out of a machine that was cleaning the air for 40 days. California Highway Patrol considers anything three times normal or above to be a hazmat. Right, so it's if this it. dust spilled out on the highway, they would close it down and roll out fire trucks. That's and, it. And we'd That's be all it. over the news. That's right. Okay. Now, this here is Japanese seaweed. Bought this back in uh, uh, August of... Uh, 2011, a few mm. months after the meltdowns after. began, a very good indicator of what kind of radiation you might have in the Pacific. This was harvested off the very southern end of Japan. Fukushima is up on the, on the northern west, side. So this, yeah, the northeast side. Check this out. This is 11 months after buying it. No, I mean, uh, eight months after buying it. And again, and again, what are the numbers that we're seeing here? Like, what well, is this what, actually telling us? What this tells us is when, when you measure this particular type of thing, you can see these tests on our site. When mm -hmm. you measure this stuff, you can determine what kind of radiation is in it. When I measure this stuff in a bag, I'm getting alpha, uh, I'm getting beta and gamma radiation. When I take it out of the bag, I'm also getting alpha radiation. With both these samples, and by the way, the latest sample that I bought just this last Friday, is much hotter. Mm -hmm. It's about 70% hotter in a direct per day comparison to this, meaning that the radiation in the water in Japan has gone up. Right. What some, people don't, some people might be saying, well, I don't, I don't eat seaweed by the handful, so I'm okay, but that's if they good. brush their teeth. They brush their teeth. You there see, might be seaweed in That's it, right. Actually. Seaweed is used in beer. It's used in, in, in toothpaste. It's used in a lot of food ingredients because it's an emulsifier. It makes things stay moist. Right, so, Michael, now that they've covered their television in plastic and they're screaming, <laughs> um, what can people really do to protect themselves? Because it does sound rather dire to just know that it's floating around in the air and it might be in the, the sushi that we're eating. It might be in the toothpaste that we're using in our mouths. Is there anything people can do right now? There's absolutely stuff people can do. And it doesn't take a lot of money. Uh, first of all, if you have some money, go down to Sears, Walmart, get yourself a heap of filter mm -hmm. uh, that cleans out the air and you can then collect these things. Right. Um, or get 12 cats. <laughs> yeah. um, either way, they'll do a yeah, great yeah. job of popping out radiated cats. Heap of filters clean your air. Okay. Uh, we have uh, water systems that purify your water. Hook up to your, uh, your, your sink, uh, hook up to your sparklets, clean your water. Mm -hmm. No... We had to cut short that interview. He was going into some very, very basic mitigation info, but I thought he did a great job of um, making a very complex subject simple for the audience to understand. And one thing that the host said at the end of that show was, was that this is very, very serious stuff, and I hope you guys take it as seriously as you should. Um, this aired on G4 TV on a show called The Loop. And that show happens to be owned by NBC and Comcast. So it's good to see they're actually talking about this in the mainstream. And we also have a short clip to play from Senator Wyden being interviewed about his recent visit to Fukushima on MSNBC. But, you know, besides um, these, these two sources, the news that's come out over the last few days has been mostly from uh, German sources or Al Jazeera. 
In fact, Deutsches Well posted that 15 of Japan's nuclear reactors are currently shut down due to damage that either came from the 9.0 or from the tsunami. I have a list of 10, and this is not verified, although I have verified that these plants exist and their proximity to the earthquake could certainly put them at risk. In addition to Fukushima that we know, there's another plant that's just south of there called Fukushima Daini, and they always call it Fukushima 2, but it's actually two different plants with a total of eight reactors. It's Fukushima Daini 1 and 2. Then there was another one north of there, Onagawa, which we have images of on Facebook showing that there was black and white smoke pouring out of the reactor buildings after the earthquake. There's 4,800 tons of spent fuel waste on that site. Hirona, which is a plant near Soma. Tamari, Higashidori. Kakasho, which is a uranium processing plant. Nami Odaka, Tokai. Tokai GCR, which is a research facility, Hamoka, and that includes, this entire list is 20 reactors with 500,000 tons of nuclear waste on site in total. Now, the German state-run TV also is seen. Reports from Japanese journalists confirm what anti-nuclear activists fear. The situation in Fukushima is much worse than the government is letting on. And a story that was posted <clears throat> last night on any news comes from a guy who's actually a, a well-known composer in Japan who dropped everything that he was doing on March 20th to go to Fukushima and try to investigate what was going on. He is saying that there are dead fetuses and mother stomachs, malformations. He can't say for sure at present what is going on and what is caused by radiation. For many, Fukushima's medical university has become Dracula's castle. And you can read his interview, which was posted in the Asian Pacific Journal on April 15th. There's a link on any news about that. And if you, if you go to the news coming out of Japan itself, there was a beauty contest held for the prettiest student who ate only food from Fukushima. And this was supported by Japan's government. Physicist and head of the Society for Radiation Protection, Sebastian Flugbiel, thinks the Japanese government's strategies to get over the catastrophe by appealing to people's patriotism is absurd. On his last trip to the East Asian country, he took a picture at a beauty contest with support from the Minister for Agriculture, a contest that was held to find the prettiest student who ate only food from the Fukushima region. I don't even know what to say about that. So Senator Wyden is making the rounds now about his recent trip. We wanted to play a short two-minute clip of that interview that aired on MSNBC. Ron Wyden is the first senator to get a look inside of Fukushima's cleanup efforts. He visited the plant a little over a week ago and joins me now. Senator Wyden, thanks so much for being on the program. Thanks for having me back. So tell us, what did you see on the ground there at uh, Fukushima? How far along are they in the cleanup efforts and what concerns you the most? They obviously have a long, long way to go. When you go in there, you, you see hundreds of tons of debris. Uh, you have huge trucks, uh, storage tankers uh, uh, thrown about like they were my twins, uh, my four-year-old twins' toys. And uh, uh, it's very clear that they're substantial. Uh, health uh, questions that have to be addressed now. I'm particularly concerned about Unit 4. There are these six uh, reactors. If, for example, you had an earthquake or a tsunami hit uh, those uh, particular pools, those pools could rupture. That could mean that the fuel rods uh, could catch fire, melt down, and you'd have uh, radiation uh, in the air that would be a huge uh, challenge to control. And, Senator, the Japanese are a very proud people. They've often been reluctant to accept outside help in the past. Are they willing to accept international help in storing these dangerous fuel rods, or have they been uh, keeping it amongst themselves? 
Well, I want to commend them, for, first of all, for allowing me to uh, to make the trip. I sit on the uh, Senate Energy Committee. I've made it clear I didn't think there was enough information getting out about uh, the cleanup. This has huge implications for nuclear power both there and, uh, and around the world. I, I do think uh, that their regulators, and, and frankly, their regulators, to their credit, will tell you that they are not as strong as our regulators here, the Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission. I do think that this is something that has to be addressed quickly. The utility company, what's called TEPCO, has a 10-year plan for essentially moving the spent uh, uh, fuel rods to uh, dry uh, dry cast, to dry storage. That, in my view, must be sped up because if uh, another earthquake or a tsunami uh, uh, hits, it could be very, very damaging, possibly more radiation than uh, earlier. Well, the only thing I didn't like about what he said was his props that he gave the NRC, and it just so happens that um, posted today, April 19th, a GOP nominee to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission lied to Congress and disqualified herself from a second term. A spokesman for Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid said Wednesday his blunt opposition to the Republican pick is part of a longer battle over the direction of the agency that regulates nuclear power, an aggressive step that has infuriated his counterpart, Senator Mitch McConnell. Japan Today is reporting, and I don't know if this has anything to do with Senator Wyden's um, candid interviews that he's been giving, but this article posted April 18th, American Engineers Design Plan to Help Fukushima Clean Up. This is very encouraging. Cincinnati, Ohio, a team of American engineers experienced in nuclear decontamination pro projects have joined forces to design a system to decontaminate the tsunami waste and soil in Fukushima. The engineering team has broad experience in decommissioning and cleanup at the Ferneld, Ohio, uranium processing facility. I wonder what happened there. And the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant accident, the team has proposed a best practices approach developed from their experience in the U.S. cleanup operations. Their process will include cesium capture during the waste cleaning and cesium capture in the system gas stream. And there were a couple of European companies that already built these huge machines to process the water after it makes contact with the nuclear fuel before it goes into the ocean or it gets reprocessed, they needed to pull the radiation out of it. But unfortunately, all those machines, and they're so big, they actually sit in like semi-trucks next to the reactors. Um, they haven't been able to keep those running because of the high radiation levels. It keeps frying the equipment. So hopefully this American engineering team will be able to put together a plan that works a little bit better. Now, Arnie Gunderson had also uh, been interviewed in the last few days, and the thing that struck me the most about his interview was that um, he equated the cesium in the spent fuel pool number four as being equal to all 800 atomic bomb tests but he uh, mentioned that this would be like one giant detonation all at one time on ground level if something happened to that pond, and that's just one isotope, of course. Other than that, I haven't heard that much from Arnie Gunderson lately, but I know that he's fairly active in some political aspects, too. I know Arnie made some comments yesterday that uh, he doesn't think TEPCO has enough money to tackle the problems that it's facing. Yeah, but you know, that that's, they said that a year ago. Yeah, yeah. When they estimated it would take hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars to clean it up, they said they're never going to be able to pay for it. So that's an issue that still needs to be resolved. For right now, I wanted to recommend... Some YouTube sources for information besides Enviro reporter Michael Collins that we heard from. Make sure that you check out Miss Milky the Clown. And we're sorry she couldn't be with us today. She had to uh, step out when we called her. Red Button Studios, Arclight 2011, who covers Europe, Radiation Test, who test products, and Connecting the Dots 1 as your link for Canada. We will be back next Tuesday been listening to Nuked Radio. Stay safe.